Hi, I'm James Barker, an associate publisher from F1000, and I'm joined today by Dr. Carl Lafleur, a research associate from McGill University and head of the Antibody Characterization Group. Uh, today we are talking about antibodies. Antibodies are a vital component of our immune system and also a vital component of research. Um, antibodies in our body will be produced in response to infections and our body engineers them to be highly specific for a process of trial and error, creating more and more antibodies until they find one that binds perfectly to the target. That specific binding to a specific target is something that we now exploit in the lab. Uh, most classically, this is done through techniques such as Western blots, where we will produce uh, commercial antibodies or might produce them in the lab ourselves. And these will be um, raised to a specific target, and then we can use them to identify those specific proteins in complex mixtures that we might extract from things like cell lines or from uh, tissue samples. Now, while there are thousands of these antibodies available, not all of them work in the way that we expect them to, either binding to incorrect targets or just not binding to anything at all. And this is obviously a massive issue when it comes to research, uh, in terms of resources and in terms of wasted time. Um, but it's something that is very rarely addressed. So, um, Carl, what would be great is if you could uh, explain a bit about this um, issue that we're having with uh, antibodies and their ability to actually work in the experiments you're using them for and a bit about the work that you're doing to address this. So thank you. Thank you, Jamie. It's actually a pleasure to be here today. Um, there's various kinds of antibodies and today we'll be discussing the research antibodies, the one that we use in the lab, as mm -hmm. you said, in contrast to therapeutic antibodies. Um, when selective, as you said, antibodies are great. They can detect one protein in a complex cell mixture. Mm -hmm. For disease, for example, we can look at a protein that will go up or down mm -hmm. in, a, in a certain disease, and if it goes up and it needs to be down, we can develop drug targets against mm -hmm. that protein and so on. And when selective antibodies can give us this information, but unfortunately, they don't necessarily behave as advertised by the manufacturers. So there are articles in the literature that used underperforming antibodies leading to bad hypotheses, bad conclusions, um, etc. When I was in the lab, we were looking at uh, cancer cells and extracting the proteins there to look at upregulation of certain, um, where it might be uh, binding sites or messenger proteins. So what are some of the examples of uh, diseases where, you know, this? these antibodies are used to characterize those proteins and what are the potential issues where they, when they don't work, what that might lead to? Um, sure. So we are at the Montreal Neurological Institute mm -hmm. at the Neuro, and we do focus on proteins involved in neurodegenerative diseases. Mm -hmm. And what's quite tremendous or really fun is that we've been able to characterize antibodies and identify key successful antibodies for all 25 proteins linked to amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, and for many proteins involved in Parkinson's disease, and many actually for Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. uh, so for us, that was a big, uh, a great breakthrough. Yeah. yeah, and I guess the uh, key problem there is, you know, where, where you might have that unspecific binding to those proteins, particularly on something like a Western blot, when you're looking at, so the relative expression. So uh, should maybe explain that when you do a Western blot, you usually use some sort of um, what you call a housekeeping protein. So usually GAP, DPH, or or something, or actin, B actin, or something like that, where you can know what the expression should be in a cell of what that would be. So then you can compare that to, say, a disease protein. So um, TP5, uh, 53 for example, in, in cancer cells where you see the upregulation or downregulation of that, you can look at that difference in expression. But if you have, for example, unspecific binding to proteins, particularly if one might be on a similar molecular weight, so that's what you're using as that comparison, that inappropriate binding could mean that when you look at that blot, you know, you're seeing more expression or less expression or expression in other areas, which is not telling you the true picture of what's happening in vivo, but on the, you know, on the page that, that you're seeing that and that. That obviously could be a massive issue down the line because you could be making assumptions on this protein does this, this protein does that, and actually it's completely unfounded. And what, while you've done everything perfectly 
for yourself, and I'm sure you, of course, do all your processes perfectly when you're in the lab, um, then but it's actually the antibody which is the crucial problem. And I guess a, another thing that should be talked about is that these antibodies aren't always cheap as well. Um, you know, some of them are, uh, are, you know, very reasonable, but if you're in research limited to, uh, settings, that can be a, a large issue as well where you're... So to jump on your point um, about having great antibodies to evaluate protein expression, so we're working at the Neuro, but in close collaboration with the Structural Genomic Consortium, the SGC. And one goal of the SGC is to explore the unknowns, mm -hmm. to explore these proteins that we don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, 90% of human proteins, we don't know much about them. But most of these proteins are involved in neurodegenerative diseases or in cancer. So with our good collection of high quality antibodies, we're now able to say, for example, in ALS, in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, where are these proteins expressed? Mm. And what we found is even though in ALS, motor neuron dies, not all ALS disease genes are expressed in motor neurons. Mm. Some are in other types of brain cells. And that really guides therapeutic routes. Mm. And that is actually very important. And that's something we're really excited about. Mm. So the community needs one or two potent, selective, renewable antibodies for every single human protein. We know without doing any work that at the moment, there's one million or so commercial available antibody for roughly 70% of the human proteome. So what we decided to do, we created Icarus. Icarus is a, is a program to characterize the available antibodies in collaboration with leading antibody manufacturers, granting agencies, participating academic, um, to characterize side by side each of these antibodies for three research applications and release quickly and openly all the data to benefit the research community. At the moment, we characterized more than 700 uh, antibodies against roughly 70 human proteins. And what's really exciting is that for most of these proteins, we could find at least one renewable antibody for each of these proteins. And this is spectacular. Yes, there's some antibodies that failed, and that's correct. We report all negative data. Mm -hmm. But in these reports, they, they can be used as a guide. You can see that there's one potentially one key renewable antibody for all three applications for most of these proteins. So as part of this, and as we've mentioned several times, these antibodies that are being used are mainly commercial antibodies and one of the large parts of working on Icarus is the fact that you're working directly with the people who are producing these antibodies. So maybe you could talk a bit about that commercial partnership that you have and how that is helping with this process of characterizing and validating these antibodies. Right, um, so these partnerships are very important. Mm. The very first step, and that was key, was to develop trusted protocols. Because mm. as you say, there's no standardized protocols for testing antibodies. Mm. Um, so that was a gradual process, but we decided to use strictly knockout cell lines to characterize these antibodies. A knockout cell line is a cell line where we removed only one gene, and that gene produces the protein of interest. So briefly, we have the parental line, and then the knockout cell line, which there's only one protein missing, and that's a protein to be targeted by the antibody. So in theory, if the antibody is specific, we will have signal in the parental cell, and abs absence of signal in the knockout cell line. And that would be our general process for all application for which we're testing antibodies. So this is a great example of commercial and research groups coming together to address a problem. But considering that the, these commercial bodies are producing these antibodies and potentially you're saying, you know, you're finding that they might not be working in the way that they're advertising, I guess the question is, um, what is the benefit here for the, your commercial partners that are helping you on Icarus? Right, that's, that's a great question. So we work in a complete open science setup. We're completely transparent. 
In our antibody characterization reports, we show both the positive results, the great antibodies, as well as the non-specific antibodies. We do not remove any data. Companies do like it, and our partnerships involve companies that are really that really care about the issue. So for example, 20% of all antibodies that we tested that are non-specific have been removed from the catalog, so no one will ever use these non-selective antibodies. And James, we do see for some diseases, and I'll take the example of Parkin, which is a protein involved in Parkinson's disease. Most of the antibodies that were used previously to our report have been used antibodies that were specific, but not perfectly outstanding. And one company saw that opportunity and developed brand new recombinant antibodies, perfectly renewable, that are performing spectacularly, both for Western blood and immunoprecipitation. And now the field have been using these two antibodies for, uh, for a little while now. And so we're publishing these data notes. So uh, data notes are articles which describe the methodology and how you've produced a set of data, but don't provide any interpretation or effectively any sort of results alongside it. it it's literally the data, how you collected it, and how you went about doing that process. What do you feel are the advantages to presenting these characterization reports in that format where it is quite agnostic without that level of interpretation about the antibodies, just providing the data about how they work? So we presented the ICRIS initiative many times and the feedback we received was that, oh, this is great work, it's easy to interpret. Um, what we found is a researcher that is looking for an antibody for Western blot will be more than able to interpret our characterization data for 10 different antibodies on a single figure. The problem with scoring an antibody would be that it, that score would be accurate in the experimental settings that we've been using for these reports. Outside these very precise experimental conditions, the antibody might be subperforming, might recognize other proteins, hard to tell. So we provide a guide so that scientists can select the most promising antibodies for their need. And it would be important that scientists be careful and acknowledge that the antibody might behave differently in their setup. Great. I think um, as well, we were just discussing earlier the fact that um, these are now being incorporated into RRIDs, so research resource identifiers, and the fact that these reports are now attached to those identifiers where people might then go away and use these antibodies and, and cite that identification that we, we at F1000 encourage authors to do and other journals do it as well. But the fact that these reports are now being associated with those IDs and providing that characterization alongside it, I think is, is vitally important and is something that really should be becoming much more universal across uh, publications to provide that peer reviewed, but also that I, th I really do think that agnostic side of it where you are just presenting the, the, the facts without any interpretation and just being like, this is the information we've provided. You can go away and interpret it. As you said, not every condition is going to be the same and a good researcher should realize that's the case and realize not just doing an experiment um, following the same protocol doesn't mean you'll get the same outcome every single time. Absolutely. Um, but providing that, that report alongside it is not only great for you to get the views on it, but I think also to provide that information where it's not previously been available, I think is, is, a, is a really good step towards addressing this replication crisis. And I think Icarus is a great uh, contributor to that. And the RID components is important. You know, we characterize hundreds of antibodies. And what I've noticed is most of the antibodies are called MAB1112. Mm. And MAB1112 could correspond to an antibody against protein X at company A, but could correspond to another protein to another company. There's really a lot of confusion. Mm. confusion. So I believe, yes, it is very important to use RIDs in published papers 
and through the RID portal, a scientist can identify available characterization data directly through the RIDs. So yes, RIDs are a key component in this, uh, in this adventure. So it's amazing having these resources available in this open format where anyone can access them. So I think, I guess, the question is, what do you see these resources that you're providing achieving and what are the next steps after that um, with the, the, the Icarus program and providing these, these characterization reports? So what we've noticed in the past year is that some antibodies that we characterized two to three years ago that we showed to be completely non-specific are still being used in research articles today. And this really annoys me. Um, we hope that these reports can really help researchers for their selection of antibodies. And I'm happy to work with you, with F1000, to have them better exposed to the community. But we need potentially another mechanism to ensure that only good antibodies are being used right now in the literature so that the ALS Society, the Parkinson Society, do generate only reproducible data. And we're having a collaboration with Harvinder Verk at the University of Leicester, who have used antibodies on human samples and figure out a year after that the antibody he was using were non-specific. Mm -hmm. And now he's pushing, addressing key antibody stakeholders so that we can try to find the mechanisms to really, really help the, the, the researchers to use only good antibodies. No, yeah, I think that's, it's, it's definitely the aim that we need to be going towards. And I think also a very important part of these, these uh, data notes and the way they're being presented is that, that open side of them. And obviously open science is at the heart of Icarus, but also the fact that it's not just that they are available to everyone, it's also the data is available to everyone. And we mentioned before how you know, these antibodies can be very expensive. So in those resource limited settings where they might be less likely to have the subscriptions to, you know, paywall journals where they might be able, where that information might be available by having these as an open resource that anyone can access, it removes that barrier. So hopefully that research waste isn't just de designated to certain regions who can access this, uh, uh, this information, it's available for everyone. I guess what we've been talking about today is some of the sort of fundamental issues that underline biomedical research right now. And we've seen these with other areas, things like open access, the sharing of open data, um, reproducibility in general. And I think one of the issues that we always see in these, uh, with these key fundamental problems is that people sort of go off into their own little sections. Researchers, they're the ones doing the work, so they're like, there's a responsibility of funders or it's a responsibility of publishers to sort this out. Publishers will say, researchers are the ones doing the research, it's their responsibility to sort it out, we're too late in the process, and that creates that stagnation where nobody wants to take accountability, where realistically everyone is accountable for the whole process throughout. It's a symbiotic relationship where it requires grant um, funders to mandate certain things, whether that be taking open data, for example, a funder mandates it, a publisher provides a venue that supports that structure, and then researchers will do it because they're mandated to do it, and it creates a nice little cycle which it changes, and then as more people do that, that changes the, the research ecosystem. And I think that Icarus provides an, a, a great example of this, but with that commercial and research partnership. So maybe you could discuss how you think that that, that process is addressing this, un, this fundamental issue we're seeing with these antibodies. It's funny because when I present Icarus, I have this slide, it's a triangle, and at each, uh, each side you have publishers, scientists, and antibody manufacturers, and everyone's saying, oh, it's your responsibility to do it, oh no, it's you. But at the end of the day, it, there's a stagnation, mm -hmm. no one's doing anything. So yes, it's been three years that we're actively characterizing antibodies. And what we're seeing is antibody manufacturers are really proactive. They are removing antibodies from their catalog. They are changing recommendation for their different antibodies. 
But what we're seeing is researchers are still using the antibodies that are not specific, even though they are great alternatives. So antibody stakeholders, such as publishers like F1000, um, researchers, funders, needs to develop a mechanism where they could see which antibodies are available and are of high quality, and we need a way to make sure that these non-specific antibodies are being used in the literature. I don't have the answer, but we'll need to sort it out. Maybe we need to organize a major symposium about this issue. Um, yeah, but it's really the issue after the antibody characterization data, after these studies have been done, what do we do with this data to ensure that everyone is taking advantage of them? Well, I think, um, just to round it all off, I think this is a really important discussion. I think as, a, as someone who's worked in a lab and as someone who's uh, you know, studied in biomedical sciences, everyone has almost certainly done a Western blot at some point in their life. And while it seems... Everyone like, has their story, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's tried to make a gel and it just fell out through the bottom. Absolutely. Everyone's tried to use an antibody and nothing's turned up on the film when they've spent hours doing it. I think it's a, a point of frustration when you're in the lab, but then when you look at it at this higher level, when you're looking at the problem it's having with the, the academic record and the, the public, and the actual published articles, it's, it's, it becomes less of a personal frustration to a fundamental issue that needs to be addressed. And the work that Icarus is doing in um, partnership with these uh, commercial partners and then publishing them through the gateway, I think is an, a, a great first step and one of the many first steps I hope we'll see with this to address that underlying issue. Um, so um, thank you, Carl, for joining us and uh, thank you for providing your, your input. Um, all of these reports are available on the Icarus Gateway, which is now available on the uh, website, f1000research.com, so forward slash Icarus.